wash it whiter than snow. Have a Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your names. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, Lord, our daily bread. And forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Today, Lord, we glorify you and we praise you. And we bless you and we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for your peace. That passeth all understanding. We thank you, Lord, for being alive, for mercy and grace, because mercy and grace and love have been given, have been bestowed unto us. Now are we the children of God. Now are we the sons of God. Now are we heirs of salvation. Now are we heirs and joint heirs with you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you for redeeming us. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Thank you for washing us in your blood. Thank you for filling us with your spirit. The interest of your word is, is what gives us strength and knowledge and understanding. So that's why we are here today. To bring honor and to bring glory to your precious name. And everything we do, we give you thanks. God, it is your will concerning us. We honor you, Lord, with the fruits of our lips. Because the Bible says, Let the redeemer of the Lord say so, whom he have redeemed from the hand of the enemy. And it furthermore stated, In all our ways acknowledge him, and he will direct our path. Mm -hmm. Today we're looking for your direction. We need your direction, we need your understanding, we need your power, and we need your anointing. We need you to guide us. The spirit of truth has come. Who is the Holy Spirit? He has come to lead and to guide us into all truth. And we are looking to Him for understanding, for illumination, for revelation. Hallelujah. That when we read the Word of God, when we study the Word of God, we will come to a knowledge of the truth. That we would be emboldened, that we will be enlightened, that we become perfect in our actions and our behavior. That everything we do will be honor and glory to Him. Thank you for your mercy again, Lord. We cannot thank you enough. Your loving kindness and tender mercies. It is by your mercy and it is by your grace that we are not consumed. Great is your faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies we see. All we have needed your hands has provided. Great is your faithfulness. Hallelujah. Thank you Lord. We were dealing with the topic. When Jesus made a statement in Mark chapter 12. Verse 29, 13, 31. He had said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Hallelujah. Amen. So we want, we want to look at the part today we're going to continue, but we want to look at the part, we shall love our neighbor as ourselves. Why is it necessary to display God's love? Why is it necessary? Why is it become a command or become a part of us that is propelled or driven or, or necessary to speak about God's love? Because his love is what constrains us. Constrain means to keep us in line. To keep us walking in the true path of righteousness. His, his love stops us from sinning. It hinders hinder the, the lust of the flesh from operating in our lives. It brings a sense of balance. A sense of direction. A sense of, of, of appreciation to our lives. We, we make the right choices and the right decisions. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Our behavior and our attitudes exemplify God. Or, or brings honor to his name. Because we do things to please him. It's our object to please him. So 
when we love our neighbor as ourselves, we will not lie, kill, steal, commit adultery, or covet what is his. In other words, we will do everything that pleases God and will not become contrary to God's word or be hurtful or harmful to, to others. What we want for ourselves, the good things of God, we would tend to share or tend to want or tend to bring about for others also. Now, this is what God said in Ezekiel 18 verse 4. Ezekiel 18 verse 4. Behold, all souls, souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sins, it shall die. Hallelujah. Amen. And if we were to compare Romans 6, 23 with this passage of scripture, we would see that it says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we talk about our neighbor. How do we love our neighbor? What hinders or what causes it causes us to, to not have this command operating in our lives? What are the problems associated with loving our neighbor? What hinders it? But the God, love of God is should brought in our hearts. But before we can consider God's love, our God's peace, our God's mercy, we have to look at the symptoms, or we have to look at the condition that mankind is in, which is sin. Sin is, is, is the problem with us. We have a sin problem. The soul, and God made a command, the soul that sins, it shall die. It's a command. When he gave that command to Adam in the garden of Eden, he said, in the day that you eat of the tree, in the tree, you will surely die. The tree that was in the center and in the midst of the garden. Whenever we disobey God, we are under his wrath. We are under his condemnation. We are subject to death. And all mankind lies under the sentence of death. All mankind. Until God delivers them or uh, show them mercy. So the soul or person that continues in sin, sinning habitually, we talk about sinning habitually, you know, sinning as a habit, sinning as a, a everyday practice, sinning as an everyday behavior trait, without repenting for his sins, thirst God, and putting faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord shall die the second death. If you continue habitually sinning, and do not repent. And put your trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. You will surely experience eternal death. Or the second death. That means those persons will be eternally separated from God. From God's presence. And suffer His wrath eternally. You will be under his wrath perpetually or continually forever and ever and ever. Amen. Now let us consider what is sin. What is sin? Many times people ask that question, what is sin? The term sin includes the original sin, actual sin, and sin committed by person. Original sin, actual sin that you are doing now, or any sin that you will commit in the future. That's what sin is. It bridges past, present, and future. The soul that sin, it shall die. So sin encompasses past, Adam. What sin? Any person that commits during their lifetime, or any sin that they will commit in the future. 
Hallelujah. Strong condition. Sin is a, a violation of God's law. Sin is, is depravity. And God hates sin with a passion. Because sin is the total opposite of God. God is holy and righteous. And he will not, for one minute, not deal with sin. A penalty will be paid for sin. The soul of a man, the soul is the immaterial part of him. We dealt with it before. Which move into the afterlife and needs to be redeemed by Christ's shed blood to be able to enter God's presence or a really experience this second death or this eternal death that we were talking about we mentioned before so the soul that sinneth it shall die the soul is the immaterial part of a man the soul and the spirit that will enter into the afterlife the body will die and go back to the ground from thus we came thus we return but the soul it's immaterial. It, can, it will not die, like let's say physically, but it will die. It can die spiritually. So you will experience spiritual death, which is total separation from God, subject to His wrath throughout all eternity, permanent, permanent condition of depravity, permanent condition of lack of love. Lack of mercy, lack of grace. Jesus made a statement that it would be better for a man not to be born than to suffer eternal death. He was speaking about, he was speaking particularly about uh, Judas Iscariot, this of condition. It was better for him not to be born. But con consider this fact if a person does not repent, he have an existence. We were dealing with an Zoe and bios, associate, life, existence, manner of living, the soul, soci, soul, heart, condition of the heart. But if you continue on sin and you die in your sin and go to hell or go to uh, experience God's wrath eternally, it would have been better for you not to have an existence. But once you have an existence, you have to spend eternity either in, either in God's presence or outside of His presence. Either in God's grace and love or outside of His grace and love. Suffering and paying the penalty for your sin, which will be under His wrath. Hallelujah. Amen. So, the second death. Blessed is He that have part in the first resurrection. If you have part in the first resurrection, the second death has no power over you. To be part, to have, to be had, to, to have part in the first resurrection, it means that you must have been born again. You you got you have to be born twice to die once. If you are born once, you will die twice. Simply means that the new birth must be experienced by anybody to have hope of eternal life in God's presence, because you are born physically, but you need to be born again. You need to be regenerated. You need to be washed in the blood. Your sin, your sin needs to be pardoned and forgiven. Your sin needs to be blotted out by the blood of Jesus Christ. This is, this is the, this is the, we would call it the new birth, regeneration. Regenerate. To be made new. So you are, you are born again. You must be born again. So you are, you are born twice, physical and spiritual. And then you will only die once. But if you if you are, if you are born once naturally, and you have not taken advantage of the of the sacrificial death of Christ, and and the blood of Jesus Christ has not been applied to your life, then you will die naturally, and you will also die eternally. What a sad condition! Hallelujah. So let's look at this word sin. A little bit further and give some examples of what sin really is. So the Greek word for sin is ham artia. H A M A R T I A. Ham artia. Sin. It means sin. Sinful. It means an, an offense. Ham artia literally means missing of the mark. 
Sin is a missing of the mark. A mark of holiness. A standard that God has set. True and perfect. And you miss it. A plumb line is used to find the center. Because of gravity, it will fall perpendicular to the surface of the ground. No matter how you how it's lean, if you're it's on an incline, it will be always be perpendicular. So a plumb line. So missing the mark. You're not walking true. You're not walking in truth. You're not walking in holiness. It is the most comprehensive term for moral, for moral deviation. Any moral deviation is sin. Anything that is outside the scope of God's holiness and righteousness is sin. Thought, deeds, action, imagination. Anything outside of that is sin. It is used of sin as a principle. Now sin is a principle. It is a, it is a habit. It is a construct in, that, is in, that is in you. That controls you. In fact, you are in bondage. You are like a slave. I know people don't like to hear the word slave. But if you are a sinner, you are a slave to sin. You are in bondage. You have no choice. It, is, it, 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 it takes control of all your moral perspective, of your conscience. It takes, it takes control of your behavior. You develop lust and hatred and malice. Sin is the root for murder, adultery, fornication, re reveling, fighting, lying, stealing. It is the cause. It is the cause of all, of all sickness and diseases. Because of sin, there is sickness and diseases. Sin is a vile, obnoxious, despicable depravity. And, and it originated with Satan himself. He's the father of sin. But we have a father of righteousness. Which is which, which, which or who has come. In the person of his son, and also by the power of the Holy Spirit to redeem us, to, to separate us, to, to deliver us from the bondage and the power of sin. So now we become slaves of righteousness, our servants of God. We are servants of God. We are servants of righteousness and holiness. Hallelujah. Amen. So sin is a governing principle of power. As in Romans 6 6. Where it is spoken of as an organized power acting through the members of the body. Sin, seek is the will. While the body is its organic instrument. So sin is centered in your will. Of course it affects your spirit and your soul. But it is centered in your will. Your will is the part of you that made choices, that made decisions. That choose to do things. I choose to worship God. I choose to sin. But the body is the instrument or the organ of sin. But sin is the principle. But it uses the body to bring about its devious, despicable acts. So that's why, that's why you use your body, your mind, your intellect, your hands, your feet, your eyes, your ears, and your mouth to sin. You use the hands to, to commit murder, to steal. You use your mind to incite hatred or to incite riot or to be or, or to bring about conditions that are despicable through jealousy and hatred and malice. And you use your mouth to, to condemn and to criticize and to lie. So the, the body is the instrument of the organ of sin. The body in itself is not sinful. But it is used to sin. Because the sin is in your nature. It's in your habit. It's in your consciousness. It's in your conscience. So it's a principle. 
And the seat of sin is the way. The seat. Uh, we would speak about the heart. This is the soul, the inner man. The heart is deceitfully wicked. And who can know it? Only God can know the heart. The heart of a man is deceitfully wicked. It means that, the, that, that sin has contaminated and polluted your, your, your will, your reasoning power, your reasoning faculty, your conscience, your memory, your imagination. Every imagination of a man is wicked from, from birth. He, 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 he devises wicked things. He imagines wicked things. Hatred and malice. How to steal, how to rob. How to, how to rebel. He developed and de um, even words and doctrine and philosophies to deceive people and lead them astray. Lead them away from, from the true path. So you miss the mark. And you will always miss the mark. You will never ever come back to the truth of yourself. Only it takes the power of God. It takes the, 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 the power of regeneration. It takes the power of a quickening spirit. To, to, to bring you back to the true path. Only God's power, God's power can save and deliver you from the power of sin. Because sin, sin is, it, it, as I said, it, it, it's an abomin it's abomination. It, it, it captures you. And it sees you. And, you. and makes you a slave. You are in bondage. And there's no escape. The soul will always sin. Unless it has been redeemed and now brought under the control and the guidance and the power of the Holy Spirit. You will always sin. You can never ever become right again unless by the power of God. Man will only get worse and worse. Jail. No penalty that the law can provide for you, that human law can provide for you, can ever redeem a man. Once a sinner, always a sinner, until you have been redeemed, until you have been washed, until you have been regenerated, until you have been justified by the power of God. Amen. There's, no, there's no other escape. There's no other remedy. There's no other remedy, remedy, remedy for sin but the blood of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. There's no other remedy for sin. There's no other escape from sin. And since there's no other escape. It means that you will suffer the penalty for sin. There is a penalty for sin. We will deal with it later in more detail. Because we are just setting up why, why did God send his son to, into the world to love us? Why did he send his son into the world to redeem us? Why is there a need for a savior? Why is there a need for the Holy Spirit? Why is there a need for, for, the, for, for the word of God? Why? We are... Lay the foundation to bring us to that place that we will understand this thing more clearly. So sin is the governing principle personified in the following verses. We can look at some verses. Hallelujah. Let's look at Romans 5, 21. Romans 5, 21. Hallelujah. Let's read from verse 20. Romans 5, 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abound, grace did much more abound. That as, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so my grace went through righteousness unto eternal life, by Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah. So the principle of, uh, of life. Is found in Christ. Or that was spiritual life. But the principle of death. Is found in sin. And it came. What, what God did. When he gave the law. In fact it says that. Death. From the time God pronounced death. To Adam. In the garden. So death reigned from Adam to Moses. Until the law came. 
If there is no law, there is no offense that can be accounted to a person because you, you do not break a law. But understand something. That was speaking about the Mosaic law when God gave the law to Moses to be delivered to the throne of Israel. Death reigned. So if death is reigning from Adam to Moses, it means that there had to be an offense between Adam time to Moses time. There had to be an offense because death was present. I was reigning. I was in control. There was no escape for man. Other than if God delivered them personally, as He did with some individuals like like Enoch and like and like um, Noah or Abel, death reign. There is a law, God's law, moral law, His righteous law, His holy law. But in time Adam sinned, he violated God's law. What God did with man, he gave man a conscience. There are different dispensations that was in effect up to Adam's, from Adam to Moses. The first dispensation was the dispensation of innocency. Man was created and he was innocent before God. So when Adam sinned, that dispensation was over. Man fell, failed. Then, then arose the dispensation of conscience. The conscience was, or uh, the conscience is that part of you that differentiates between right and wrong. God gave man a conscience so that he will know right from wrong. So because there was no covenant or no law given that would show forth God's holiness and righteousness, the conscience was empowered by God as a means to, to show forth to him or to show forth to man that there is a right and a wrong. So your conscience was your guide or your judge. Or it, it still is. But man, sin, affected his conscience. So therefore, he could not make right choices. That's why God said in Genesis 6, 6 that Man, the imagination of man was wicked continually. And God says, it, 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 it like repented him. He, he, he decided or determined that he would get rid of man. There's a sin. And there's a death. But there's a penalty. Many people don't believe in God's wrath. And God's holy judgment. God's wrath is God's holy disposition against sin. Hatred of sin. You don't believe in it. But when you look at the Bible, the Bible is full of God's judgment. Eternal damnation is going to be the final part of it. But there are specific times in the history of mankind where God judged. And where God poured out his wrath. And the most notable one in the Bible, when he flood the world, the old world, and saved only eight people. No his sons and their wives, and those wives, eight souls, out of, out of all humanity that was on earth at that time, God wiped them out. Why? Because of sin. Sin is despicable. It will bring God's judgment. So let's also look at, hallelujah, Amen. Romans chapter 6, verse 12. Romans 6, 12, hallelujah. Likewise, reckon ye also yourself to be dead, indeed unto sin, but alike unto God, to Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies, that ye should not, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God, as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Again, we say that the, the will is the seat of sin, but the body or the members of the body are the tools or the instruments that sin uses. 
So Paul is saying that we must not let sin reign in our body. Sin must not control our behavior. Sin must not control our action. When you are a child of God, you walk in holiness. You walk in righteousness. It is the love of God that is propelling you. It is the love of God that is propelling you. It is the strength of the Holy Spirit that is guiding you and leading you. So you don't use your members of your body as instrument of unrighteousness, hate to the malice and, and lying and stealing and cheating. No. You use your members now as instrument of praise and honor and worship to God. You offer all praises, the fruit of your lips, worship. Your body is now become instrument of righteousness and holiness. You use your body to pray and to glorify God and become a help to your neighbor. You love your neighbor as yourself. You help your neighbor. Hallelujah. Let's look at Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Hallelujah. Romans 3, 23. We know that scripture very well, but let's read it. Hallelujah. Amen. For all have sinned, all, and come short of the glory of God. Again, missing the mark, come short of the glory of God. Every man has sinned. All, all mankind lies, give before God. Because Adam sinned, Adam's sin was passed on to every person that was born or will be born after him. Adam was the person that God used to represent mankind. He was the federal head of all mankind. So Adam was the one that God made contract with. He said to Adam, do not eat. In the day that you eat, you shall surely die. Not only Adam, all of his descendants would die. But what God did, uh, God had already planned to do anyway, it was part of his plan, he would send a second Adam. The second Adam is a quickening spirit. The second Adam is Jesus Christ himself. He's the first. You know, we say that Adam was the first man, which is true. But from what perspective? Adam was the first revealed man. The first man that was put into the world. But Adam is not really the first man. The first man is always Jesus. Jesus is the first man. He was revealed second, but he's the first. When God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. He was really referring to the, in the letters of Jesus. Because Jesus is the quickening spirit. Adam is just a, 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 a soul, a living soul. Adam cannot, all Adam can do is give physical life. He cannot give spiritual life. He cannot give eternal life. So the, 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 the preeminent one, who is Jesus Christ himself, he is the one that is the first. And all things, he must have the preeminence. So it is true Christ that we have life. True life. True spiritual life. True hope. True joy. True peace. True love. True understanding. It is true him. Because he came that we might have life. And have it more abundantly. He cannot, we might have spiritual life. We might have hope. We might have joy. We might have reverence before God. We might have communion with God. He came to redeem us, to buy us back, and deliver us from the penalty of our sin. Hallelujah. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord forever and ever and ever. Amen. Let's look also at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. Hallelujah. He says, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committed fornication sins against his own body. Then he goes further in verse 19. What? He asks the question, what? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? which ye have of God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. Now, Paul is speaking to redeem persons, to us, the children of God, the believers. Hallelujah. So he says, flee fornication. Every sin that a man does is without the body. It means that if you kill it's without. 
When you lie and you speak, it's without, the, it's without. But when you commit fornication, you're joining your body to an idol, to ungodliness. It, 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 it affects your body. And you sin it against your own body. First, of course, you sin against God, but you're co committing sin against your own body. Then he says, what? Don't you realize, don't you know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost? When the Holy Spirit comes, he takes possession of our bodies. That's what we read and it says that God said, all souls are mine. All souls are mine. We belong to God. We are, we are his sheep. We belong to him. And sin wants to take us away from God. But when we receive Christ as Savior, the Holy Spirit resides in us. We are his temple. So if you violate or you deface or contaminate your body, you're contaminating the temple of the living God. God doesn't dwell in temple made with hands. He dwells in people. He came to dwell in us. We are going to be living sacrifices before God. We're going to be living stones. We are going to be instruments of, of grace that can be seen. Grace is a, is a principle. Grace is a, one, of the, uh, one of the attributes that God bestows to us. It is one of, uh, of, one of his graces. But when God saves you, it is by grace that we are saved through faith. Ephesians 2 verse 8. But we are going to be living examples of what grace is. We are going to be personification of love. We are going to be personification of mercy. We are going to be personification of grace. Actually, grace seen in bodily form, a, a, a bodily shape, is not only a principle, it's going to be a manifestation of people. We're going to demonstrate God's grace then. We're going to demonstrate God's love. We're going to demonstrate God's mercy through all eternity. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, Hamartima, H-A-M-A-R, T E M A that we're looking at from as a, as a as a noun. It denotes the act of disobedience. It's an act. So sin is an act. Sin is a sin is a principle, but this principle causes a behavior, a change in your behavior. It affects your behavior then. So the, the principle now is brought into effect. Are action through your body. So you, you can look at sin as a noun, something. Hallelujah. So you can say it's an act of disobedience to divine law. All our laws. Pure. Let's look at Mark 3.28. Hallelujah. Mark 3, verse 28. Verily I say unto you, all sins, with the S, S I N S, shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies, wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that sh shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost have never forgiveness, but it is in danger of eternal damnation. You're walking in rebellion against God. The Holy Spirit is a medium through which that we are saved. The Holy Spirit comes to convict us of sin. The Holy Spirit is the one that takes the blood of Jesus Christ and applies it to our hearts. In fact, actually, before he, before anything that is ever done to a man that is in sin, the Holy Spirit must give him life. He must quicken him. He must bring him to life. Because what sin does, sin kills you. You are spiritually dead. And you have he quickened who were, who were dead in trespasses and sin. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. When you are in sin, you are dead. You are a dead man. Like this, like this pulpit here. You are dead. You are physically alive, but you are spiritually dead. From God's perspective, you are dead. And from your own perspective, you are also dead. Because you have no love for God. 
You have no desire to worship God. You have no desire for the things of God. In fact, you, you, you have no, not only do you have no desire, you have no power. You cannot, you cannot come to God of your own. No man can come to God. No man chooses to come to God by himself. The Holy Spirit draws him. Or the Father draws him through the Holy Spirit. It is, it is God that draws you to himself. It is God that applies grace to you. It is by grace that we are saved through faith. But grace is the medium. Grace is the cause. Grace is the source of our salvation. Now, it is through faith. Because faith is necessary for justification. But, but the Holy Spirit is the one that quickens you first. He must apply the quickening touch. Imagine a dead man. He went into the river or in the sea. And he drowned. He's unconscious. He's dead. He's lying on the sand. And here comes the EMT and performs uh, CPR on him. And he resuscitates him. That man that was lying on the sand played no part in his resuscitation. In fact, he, didn't, he doesn't even know what happens. Only when he comes to life again, only when life is restored to him, he understands that he was dead and someone came and offered him or helped him and brought him back to life. So when you are a sinner, you have no concept of God's holiness. You have no concept of God's righteousness. You have no desire. Faith, you have no faith. But what God does, He quickens you. And in quickening you, He imparts faith to you. He imparts grace and faith. And because you have faith, now you come to understand that you are a sinner. Now you begin to see yourself as sinful and wicked and evil in need of God's love. In need of God's help. So he said, Lord, help me. Lord, save me. Lord, forgive me. Lord, have compassion. Lord, have mercy upon, 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 upon me. Because I realized that the, your voice said, you sent your son into the world that I might be saved. So Lord, let that work be done in me. So, be here. You make mistakes. And we walk contrary to God's law. So we see that as a nun, a martima, you know, act of disobedience. But let's, let's also look at it from, the, from as a verb. How martano, instead of an A, is going to end in N-O. Instead of M-A, it ends in N-O. H-A-M-A-R-T-A-N-O. Hamartano, a verb. A verb means action, what you do. A verb is a doing word. It literally means, as we said, missing the mark. And a share in the price. If you miss the mark, you cannot expect a share in the price that is given out for winners. Miss the mark. It's not we're talking about Greek. How the Greek will literally literally interpret it. Missing the mark and in so doing a share in the price. That's so that's that is like literal meaning, right? But figuratively it means to err. Figuratively to err, to make mistakes, to sin, to trespass, to offend. It is used as sin against God by men and by angels. Hallelujah. So, today we want to thank God for His grace. Because it's by grace that we are saved. Grace is a, is a, is a fountain. Grace is a method. Grace is, is, is a cause that God uses to deliver us. Because He is the cause of our salvation. God the Father is the cause. Jesus Himself, He is a meritorious cause. He is a means through which God applied grace. And the Holy Spirit is the one that communicates that grace to us. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 20 verse 40 says, the, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us. So we thank God for His grace and His mercy and His love. Because by that we have been saved. By that we have been delivered from the power of sin. By that sin has no more dominion over us. We are the sons of the living God. We are, his, we are heirs of salvation. And we are joint heirs with Christ. Hallelujah. We have of God's eye. Hallelujah. We are, we, are, we are royal priesthood. We are holy nation. We are peculiar people. He have, he have called forth 
put of darkness in his marvelous light. We walk by faith and not by sight. We are the elect of God. We are the children of God. We are strong. Hallelujah. We are we are walk in peace and in love. We, are, we have hope. We have joy. We have we have strength. We have we have faith. And we use and we use our bodies as instruments of righteousness to glorify and worship God and honor Him. So continue in this path that we are in. Let everything that has breath continue to praise God. Let sin have no more dominion over us. Don't walk in sin, but walk in righteousness. May God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.